All jokes aside, growing up as an immigrant in New York City was tough figuring out how I fit in. And I wonder how these guys handled that same struggle here in the Midwest. How do you keep your, your Mexican culture if you are keeping it alive? So when our family moved here, it was like we had to adapt, right? It was like more Americanizing us right. so we can be accepted. Right, right. We're Mexican-ish. We're not into traditional that much, but when I went to the Canelo fight, and they're singing the Mexican national anthem. I'm like, what the hell is this song? Everybody's singing. I don't know. I don't know everybody's singing. All of a sudden, I was listening to the whole crowd. I'm like, damn, I'm not Mexican. Right, right. <laughs> I'm missing all this culture yeah, yeah. because I'm from the south side of Chicago. Right. But I'm like, you know, I'm like into the culture every day. So I was like, damn. And I felt that pride. Right, right. Even though, like I said, you know, say people from Mexico don't really like Mexicans from America. So what's the beef? What's the hate? Because we're Mexican, hating? but we're not Mexican. And then Americans gotcha. don't hate Americans don't like Mexicans because we're not Americans. So it's like we're in the middle. No, so I, I like, felt like too. I felt that too. Being a you know Latin Colombian guy, I was look, I was always kind of feeling like I was in between in between worlds. You know, I wasn't really Latin enough, and I wasn't really accepted by Americans. So I was always like trapped somewhere in the middle. Here in Chicago, it's like the higher numbers you grow up, it's like the better wow. area you're in. So if you go from like Little Village, which is like 26th Street, to the higher numbers, like we're in the 60s right, right. now, it's like you're doing better in life. Yeah. You're doing better in life. So yeah. in the 80s, we got to 47th Street, and we were the only, one of the only Mexicano families in the whole neighborhood, in the whole neighborhood. For miles, yeah. We weren't accepted. We were not accepted. And how, how did they show that you weren't accepted? Uh, they burned down our garage. Oh, snap. They graffitied our house. When we first moved here, I think it was, I think I was 11, so like 80, like mid 80s or whatever. And we went to the park, Market Park. And that's the first time that I've heard Spick and Wetback yeah, exactly. and, and Razor go back to your country. I was in seventh grade, dude. Like, you don't want to hear that when you're in seventh grade. Like, that hurts, dude. Yeah. And I would get in the fights, uh -huh. you know? But when I met these guys, I was like, High school years. 16, 17. Yeah. We just became boys. So what made you become friends? We were kind of like the two, you know, we were ner nerdy or whatever. And, and then I met his mom, you know, Sylvia. Yeah. Oh, so your she, mom? Yeah. yeah. And she's like my second mom. She always pushed school. She was the first one in the whole family with a bachelor's degree. My parents, you know, they came from Mexico. She's, you know, second generation. But her sphere of influence is, is like crazy, dude. It, yeah. You know, like, it, it, it's really affected everyone. Like, I would have never thought to be an actor I thought well, we were all working in factories or something. You know, I, I never dreamt that big. She's the one who told him to go on his first audition. Incredible. But he's always been a hard worker, dude. Yeah. Even if he didn't succeed in acting, whatever else he would have done, he would have been he would have been great at it, dude. Period. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got it. You got, got it. You got there we go. Look at oh, that. That's look why he's at my that. Best friend. That's right. Oh, he's gonna put a poster, Michael Pena, for president. <laughs> it sounds like you always had a work ethic and you always had a, a sense of keeping at something till you got good at it. Like, you were driven. Yeah, and I learned it from forward. that guy. From my dad. Which guy? Yeah. From we that guy. <laughs> he had a full-time job, and then he had a job at night, and then he had a job in the weekend. Right. To put me through prep school. Prep school was... It was expensive. Yeah, yeah. It was, Dude, it was I had cash. to work two full-time jobs in the summer, and I remember I slept, like, three, four hours a night because it was two eight-hour shifts. ¿Cómo se siente oír eso de que tu hijo dice rico, no? Sí. Yeah, yeah. Que tú lo, enseñ lo, lo, lo enseñaste bien. Yeah, lo que fue, lo que fue. Balancing multiple cultures for first-generation Latinos is never easy, especially if they're made to feel like outsiders in their new home. Sometimes friends who feel like family can provide that extra support, and in Michael's case, it was his godmother, Sylvia. So I, I, want, I want to hear how uh, you inspired all these young, young fellas into being who they are today. Well, I, I had the high school uh, across the street from my house, so these guys were always hanging out. My son always was bringing somebody home, but Mike was full of energy. And I said, he's got to do something with this energy. I, I think he would be good as an actor. You were like a skilled placements person. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw the skills that he had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm so proud of him. I mean, we're also proud of him. He's very humble, and he's true to his family and his neighborhood, and he always comes back. He always comes back, uh, you know, to visit home. Each wave of Latinx immigrants sets down a new foundation for the next generation to build upon. And it's these extra support systems that create opportunities where they didn't exist before.